If you are interested in shooting video but not sure where to start, this is the video for you. I'm going to cover the basics of shooting video and explain confusing terms like shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Be sure to stick around until the end of the video because I want to give you a free resource that will be a huge help while you're getting started with video. Hi, my name is Luke, creator of WeddingFilmCoach.com. Uh, Wedding Film Coach is all about helping beginners get started with video, focusing on three key areas, philosophy, craft, and business. If you'd like to learn more, go to WeddingFilmCoach.com. So if you're interested in shooting video, maybe you've started doing some research or possibly even have a DSLR camera uh, or a mirrorless camera. And you turn it on, you look at the back of the camera, see all the settings, and you're thinking, okay, now what? Uh, these cameras are a bit different than our phones, right? Um, but they give you so much control over your image and pretty much every aspect of capturing um, something beautiful, it gives you the ability to do that. But it can be a bit overwhelming at first. But don't worry, the easiest way to get started is simply to put the camera in auto mode and get shooting. This will at least let you have a little fun, get some good footage, and show it off to your friends, right? Uh, but if you're ready to start learning how to get beautiful footage you see other people posting online, then these tips will help you out a lot. So we're going to focus on three terms, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. These three functions control the exposure or brightness of your image. A great way to explain this is to use what people refer to as the exposure triangle. Here's an image of the exposure triangle and the settings on my camera. I'm going to change each of these settings individually to show you how they affect the exposure on your image. Then we'll come back and talk about some more advanced ways to use these functions. So here's my camera. I've already dialed in my settings to reflect correct exposure. Correct exposure simply means that the shadows, midtones, and highlights uh, in my image all maintain detail and they're easily discernible. I'll talk more about those things in another video. For now, here's my image and I'm going to decrease my shutter speed. Notice that as I slow down my shutter speed, this is telling the camera I want to let more light hit the sensor, causing the brightness of the image to increase. As I increase my shutter speed, notice the opposite happens. There is less light hitting the sensor, so the brightness of the image decreases. Let's move on to aperture. This function relates to the size of the iris on your lens. As you decrease the aperture f value, this will make your iris larger, meaning you are letting more light hit your camera sensor, increasing the brightness of your image. The opposite is true if you increase your aperture f value, this will make your iris smaller, letting in less light, causing the brightness of the image to decrease. Lastly, ISO. ISO is a bit simpler in that it's, as you increase the value, you increase the brightness. As you decrease the value, you decrease the brightness. Now that we've got that covered, you might be asking yourself, why do we need three different functions to control the exposure of the image? Uh, like I mentioned before, let's get into some of the more advanced features of these functions and it'll all start to make sense, I promise. Shutter speed. While shutter speed is one of the functions that controls your exposure, it also allows you to control how motion is captured. Specifically, it will allow you to capture more or less motion blur. I'm gonna show you some footage of cars passing by my house and uh, I'm gonna put my shutter speed at different speeds. The slower the shutter speed captures more motion blur in the image, while the faster shutter speed captures less blur and produces an overall sharper image. Uh, so what is better, more or less motion blur? Well, it's not necessarily that more or less is better or worse, but it does have to do with what you want your footage to look like creatively. Most movies are shot at 1 48th shutter speed, which would be comparable to about 1 50th on DSLR cameras. This gives them the ability to get a slight motion blur from their subjects without seeming too soft. At the same time, several directors will take creative decisions to increase their shutter speed to achieve a more choppy, dynamic look, especially if they're filming a fast-paced fight scene where they want the viewer to feel the action. As a general rule of thumb, you can start with keeping your shutter speed at 1 over 50 while shooting in 24 frames per second and 1 over 125 while shooting in 60 frames per second. And there's a little bit of math and science behind that, but if you're wondering what the difference is between 24 and 60 frames per second, again, I'll cover that in a different video. Aperture. Your aperture, in addition to controlling exposure, also controls your depth of field, commonly known as background blur or bokeh. A very shallow depth of field with lots of background blur behind it is 
uh, what most people associate with higher quality video. And while that's not necessarily true, it is a unique effect that helps your footage look crisp and professional and sets it apart from most other footage. So how do you get a shallow depth of field or more background blur with your aperture? You want to put the lens at the lowest F value, which will make your lens uh, iris as wide open as possible. This is going to increase your exposure, but also provide you with a more narrow depth of field. The opposite is true if you increase your F value. This will widen your depth of field and create less background blur. This falls into the same category where one is not necessarily better than the other. Uh, if you have more background blur, it's more difficult to maintain accurate focus and make sure your subject remains sharp in your image. Uh, with less background blur, sometimes you run the risk of losing a subject uh, among a busy background and a more shallow depth of field could help set them apart in a creative way. And it also just looks more creative. Lastly, ISO. What else does ISO do other than contribute to your exposure? Once again, this one's probably one of the easiest in that it doesn't really have a secondary feature that affects the way your footage look. However, ISO does come with a side effect. As you increase your ISO, you introduce video noise into your image. Many cameras are now available to reduce this side effect in amazing ways. However, it is important to know that as you increase your ISO, if you do it too much, you may introduce too much noise into your footage that would cause your footage to lose its overall attractiveness and look of quality. Here's a few examples of footage with video noise caused from higher ISO values so you can see what I'm talking about. So here's the image of the exposure triangle again, explaining how each one of these functions affects your exposure and how they change the creative nature of your footage. I hope this video has provided you with some awesome info and given you the ability to go out and start shooting video in manual and testing out different setting combinations to find out what you like best. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I'll help in any way that I can. If you're wanting to get into wedding videography, click on the link in the description for my free ebook on how to get started with wedding filmmaking. I promise it, it will make your first wedding go so much easier than mine did, uh, or just trying to figure it out on your own. I would love to help you in that way. I'm Luke from WeddingFilmCoach.com. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.